In September 1998, James Cain, former CEO of Bear Stearns, had refused to chip in towards the bailout of the hedge fund Long-Term Capital Management, LTCM, the imminent failure of which threatened the very fabric of Wall Street. Doing so, warned Herbert Allison, former president of Merrill Lynch, would come to haunt Bear Stearns in the future. Allison's words proved prophetic, as ten years later, after accumulating tremendous exposure in collateralized debt obligations, James Cain's firm was bailed out and sold to J.P. Morgan Chase. Today we take a look at the event that might have precipitated this karmic retribution, the rise and fall of LTCM, the secretive hedge fund with two Nobel laureates as partners, and whose interconnectedness with every single large financial institution on Wall Street and beyond, extending to banks in Great Britain, France, Switzerland, etc., conferred upon it too-big-to-fail status. LTCM was founded by John Merriweather in 1994. While at Salomon Brothers, Merriweather had put together a team of math whizzes to take advantage of arbitrage opportunities in the bond market. Before long, Merriweather's arbitrageur group was responsible for the majority of Salomon's profits, boosting his reputation and that of his traders. His career at Salomon was cut short, however, as he was eventually ousted after one of his subordinates was caught spoofing orders in an effort to manipulate the market in two-year notes. Following the scandal, Merriweather started LTCM, and his team eventually ended up joining him at the fund. Although a regime of strict adherence to this rule was not always enforced, LTCM didn't believe in making directional market bets. Rather than trying to predict which way markets would move, a fool's errand in their view, the fund's main go-to were convergence strategies, that is, strategies based on the predicted return to some equilibrium point, estimated on the basis of empirical historical observations. Let me give you an example. The United States government routinely issues debt at various maturities. Treasury notes with maturities of 2, 3, 5, 7, and 10 years, and 30-year Treasury bonds. In 1994, the February 1993 issue of the 30-year bond was trading at a yield of 7.36%. The exact same bond issued six months later, in August, on the other hand, was yielding only 7.24% or 0.12% less. A lower yield means the bond is more expensive. In Wall Street parlance, the older bond with 29 and a half years to maturity is said to be off the run, while the new issue is known as on the run. Off the run bonds aren't as actively traded, as investors tend to buy them for a long-term keeping. This gives rise to small market inefficiencies and to arbitrage opportunities, as both bonds should trade at around the same price. After all, the probability the U.S. government defaults on a bond that matures in 29 and a half years, and on one expiring in 30 years, is, for all intents and purposes, essentially the same. The spreads would eventually converge, and LTCM would make money. The problem is that 0.12%, 12 basis points, is absolutely minuscule. The only way to make the trade worth it would be to use prodigious amounts of leverage. And make use of leverage they did. The LTCM group had parlayed their success at Solomon into rock star status. Robert Merton and Myron Scholes were also principals at LTCM and the duo would eventually be awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 1997, 
less than a year before LTCM had to be bailed out by Wall Street. This VIP status granted LTCM access not only to investor capital, but also to leverage. The fund partners operated with an air of superiority and demanded financial institutions forego standard haircut requirements. Normally, when a party borrows a bond, the counterparty generally requires a little bit of extra collateral to be posted. This extra collateral is called a haircut. For example, let's say you want to borrow $50,000 and are willing to post your Pokemon trading card collection as collateral. Now, collectibles are inherently riskier than, say, stocks or bonds. Their value is subjective and influenced by fats, and the market for these is fairly illiquid. Given the uncertainty and hassle associated with the deal, you might still get your loan, but the counterparty might only recognize the collection as being worth only, say, $30,000 in collateral. This difference is called the haircut, and LTCM thought such requirements were beneath them. Strangely enough, financial institutions gave in to their demands, hoping indulging the fund's whims would one day allow them to profit from access to LTCM's order flow. They were therefore willing to make an exception for Meriwether's merry band of arbitrageurs and forego the customary haircut. This frictionless trading arrangement gave LTCM a tremendous advantage. Here's how. Returning to the off-the-run slash on-the-run example, the fund would buy the -the off-the-run issue with a higher yield, which means a lower price since bond prices and yields are inversely correlated, and then immediately loan the bonds to some other firm. The counterparty would then wire collateral for the loan. LTCM would then immediately turn around and use this cash as collateral to short the -the on-the-run bond with the lower yield, making money when the prices converged. In other words, This arrangement allowed long-term capital management to execute this entire trade, worth $2 billion, without having to put up any money of their own. The fund performed phenomenally well. In just over four years, an investment in the fund had quadrupled, before accounting for the partner's fees. Even after adjusting for fees, the fund had offered a return on investment of 185%. The partners had supreme confidence in their models and ever-expanding repertoire of trades, taking on significant personal loans to invest in the fund, and even returning outside capital to investors in Q4 of 1997, less than a year before the fund went belly up. They even got UBS to write them a call option on the fund's performance. This was a good deal for LTCM because it gave them upside exposure to their own funds over performance. The call was valued at $800 million, which UBS then hedged by buying a $800 million interest in the fund from the partners themselves. UBS had wanted to buy a significant stake in the high-flying hedge fund, something which was very difficult to achieve, so the deal also looked attractive in the Swiss investment bank's eyes. As a sweetener, UBS was permitted to invest a further $266 million in long term. There were also tax benefits for both parties, but in reality, this was a terrible deal for the Swiss investment bank because being short a call and long shares meant they were essentially short a synthetic put option on LTCM's performance. Put in plain English, their losses could be catastrophic if LTCM were ever to go under, which, spoiler alert, they eventually did. Meriwether had provided assurance, with comical mathematical precision, that a loss of 20% or more of the fund's portfolio was a statistical event occurring only once every 50 years. This proverbial 50-year flood didn't take long to materialize, 
in the form of a debt moratorium by the Russian government in August 1998. Market participants had grown complacent in the belief that U.S. and IMF intervention was enough to avert any catastrophe. After all, that had been the case with Mexico and with the Asian Tigers. And when it came to the Russian economy, investors found reassurance in the oft-repeated platitude that nuclear powers don't default. As it turns out, there are no absolutes, and nothing is off the table in the world of finance, and market participants were starting to realize that there was no safety net. This led to a massive flight to quality assets, as liquidity dried up across all markets LTCM had exposure to. The fund's strategy had been to wait for a pair of similar assets to converge toward a quote-unquote rational equilibrium point. After all, on-the-run and off-the-run bonds should be priced almost identically, and in the case of a dual-listed company like Royal Dutch Shell, it seemed preposterous that the Dutch-listed company would trade at a premium to its English counterpart, considering how both companies got their income from dividends on the combined Anglo-Dutch oil consortium. And yet, spreads only continued to widen. Royal Dutch had traded at a premium of about 8%. After the Russian default and a subsequent flight to safety, this spread had continued to widen, reaching a staggering 22% after the LTCM bailout had been finalized and the Federal Reserve had reduced interest rates. What's more is that this wasn't an isolated incident. Spreads were widening across the board as a mindset of extreme de-risking took hold of investors. LTCM's demise was now imminent, and behind closed doors, the Federal Reserve and the heads of major Wall Street banks discussed a possible domino effect capable of toppling the entire market edifice. A bailout was inevitable, but it was thought better to solve the crisis internally rather than let the U.S. taxpayer foot the bill. Fourteen financial institutions, including foreign banks, would pony up a combined total of $3.65 billion into a lifeline giving LTCM enough breathing space to liquidate its positions. This came to about $300 million apiece, give or take, a fairly modest amount for the parties involved. John Corzine of Goldman tried to get one over on the other participating banks through a joint proposal between Goldman, AIG, and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. However, Buffett's proposal didn't go through due to a legal technicality. The Oracle of Omaha's offer was incorrectly worded as a bid for LTCM's assets, when in fact what he wanted was the portfolio, or LTCP. These were two separate entities, so the deal ultimately fell through, although one really has to wonder how much Buffett really wanted the portfolio in the first place. After all, he'd spent the greater portion of the negotiation process in and out of cell range as he vacationed in the Alaskan fjords and later at a Montana ranch. The bid should also have taken into account long-term's complex particulars, so he couldn't have been too keen. Ultimately, it was the banks that funded the bailout. LTCM was able to liquidate its portfolio at a small profit to the rescuers, and a financial crisis was averted. And what about Meriwether and the partners? Well, they lost the greater portion of their personal fortunes, but still got to keep their lavish homes. What's more, little over a year after the collapse, Meriwether launched JWM Partners, a new hedge fund with members of his old arbitrageur crew as principals. The fund lost approximately half its value between September 2007 and February 2009, eventually shutting down in the summer of that year, to the surprise of absolutely no one. <laughs> 